Uh, this afternoon, we have some scientists that have done just that uh, through physics that have worked uh, very hard to, to improve our understanding uh, about life, the universe, uh, the cosmos, uh, our place in it, and uh, how this works and fits together. Uh, probably generated more questions uh, than answers. And so I'm going to read a brief biography of them. I know several of you have had the chance to attend their sessions today. So if you'll indulge me for a few moments while I read their biography, and then we'll get right into the program. So uh, this is our inaugural Leon M. Letterman Frontiers, Frontiers of STEM Symposium on Physics. We have our three great minds from Fermi Lab National Accelerator Laboratory. It is a place uh, not just close in proximity, but close to our heart uh, in many ways. You know, several of you have done research there, uh, but, but we're, I think, particularly indebted because uh, our founding father uh, is a former director of Fermi National Laboratory, and that's Nobel laureate who has joined us today, Dr. Leon Letterman. Leon, could you uh, stand up and wave? <laughs> and uh, he, he is quite a, a guy, I'll tell you. And uh, thank you so much for joining us, Leanne. It means a, a lot to all of us to have you here, as well as some of your colleagues from Fermi, uh, as well as our great minds uh, speaking here. So this has been an exciting day full of uh, classroom interactions, the breakout sessions. We had a, a terrific session at, at lunch. And um, we've, we've learned a great deal, but I, I think the opportunity now is to focus on this third part of our mission statement, and that's the part about um, asking profound questions. So uh, asking those questions will be you. Providing answer to those questions uh, will be our three experts. And I'll start with Dr. John Peoples. Uh, Dr. Peoples is our expert on accelerator building. He's also a former director of Fermilab, like Leon. Uh, he has been active in Fermilab's scientific program for 40 years. During the first 20 years, he led the construction of new facilities such as the antiproton source, which was a key element in transforming the Tevatron into a proton-antiproton collider. While he was director of the laboratory, he successfully sustained the Tevatron as the world's highest energy collider. He received the 2009 American Physical Society Robert R. Wilson Prize for critical and enduring efforts in making the Tevatron collider the outstanding high-energy physics accelerator of the last two decades. As director, he expanded the Fermilab scientific program to include experimental particle astrophysics, which he joined after he completed his term as director. He has participated in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey and is participating in the Dark Energy Survey. He is a fellow of the American Physical Society and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And um, while we read about these great scientific accomplishments, often we don't understand what goes into being a director and that's so much of the politics and funding to sustain the work of the lab. And that is uh, not insignificant uh, by any matter, John. So uh, you have done a, a great job of laying the foundation uh, for, for greater advances even after you left. And I know we all, all appreciate that. Please welcome Dr. Peoples. Uh, next to his left is Dr. Scott Donaldson, our expert in the area of cosmology. In addition to being a scientist at Fermi, he's a professor in the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics at the Kavli Institute for Cosmological Physics at the University of Chicago. He received his PhD from Columbia University. He did his postdoc work at Harvard and at Fermilab. He was hired onto the staff of Fermilab in 1994 and served as head of the theoretical astrophysics group and co-founder and interim director of the Center for Particle Astrophysics. He is the author of the textbook Modern Cosmology and has written over 130 scientific papers and edited two other books. Dr. Donaldson has worked for over 20 years on the connection between the very large cosmology and the very small particle physics. He has contributed mightily to our understanding of dark energy, dark matter, and inflation. Dr. Donaldson, welcome. And to his left, we have Dr. Marcella Corina, our expert in theoretical physics. 
She is an internationally renowned expert in particle physics who works on revolutionary ideas about to be tested at the Large Hadron Collider in CERN. She has developed and extended theories to explain the origins of matter and mass, as well as the identity of the mysterious dark matter that fills the universe. She has proposed connections between the Higgs boson, supersymmetry, extra dimensions of space, and the unification of all forces and matter. Dr. Karina is a senior scientist at Fermi and a professor of physics at the University of Chicago. She has worked closely with experimental physicists at Fermi Lab and CERN Laboratory, developing strategies for discovery at the, these world's uh, highest energy particle colliders. She was born in Buenos Aires, a Spanish and Italian heritage. Dr. Karina did her undergraduate studies in Argentina, did her PhD work at the University of Hamburg in Germany. She has held research positions in Germany and Switzerland before moving to the United States at the University of Chicago. Dr. Karina, welcome to the Illinois Math and Science Academy. And so at this point, we are going to open this up uh, to questions um, from you, uh, from the faculty members, uh, from the students. It can be about their specialties, it can be about science, it can be about advancing the human condition, uh, anything that's on your mind. We have uh, microphones, we have some over here, we have a microphone over there. And uh, being first is a, a, an incredibly courageous act. And uh, so let's see who will be first. Yeah, let's hear it, all right. Does this work? Okay, cool. Yes. Um, I'm interested in the idea that there could be extra dimensions in space. If there are, how can we interact with them? Can we interact with them directly? Okay. I try. I try. <laughs> um, so, of course, we, we don't know if they are there, but um, uh, these are ideas that have been around for a while and have been, um, there has been a revival. Um, um, maybe more than 10 years ago. Um, so the idea is if there are extra dimensions of a space, uh, for sure gravity will propagate there. So there will be um, like gravitons uh, going into the extra dimensions. And so how do we see them in our, well, first of all, they could be very different. They could be from very different sizes and they could also uh, be flat or some warping, some uh, curvature. Um, the way we try, the ways we try to um, access them, uh, for example, at high energy colliders in our four-dimensional world, correct, would be either to uh, measure, um, for example, um, copies of the particles we know. If the particles we know will propagate in these extra dimensions, the way we will see it in our four-dimensional world would be with copies of these particles, like they're called Calusa Klein Towers. And so we are trying to, depending on how, the, how, how many there are, and as I said, if they are flat or curved space, um, we could have different um, properties for these copies of the, uh, of, of the towers, of the particles we know. Uh, the other way would be to measure um, as a, a continuous energy uh, the position uh, due to the, um, to, the, to the gravitons that are propagating or, or disappearing, so to say, in the extra dimension. So there are different type of um, searches that are being uh, performed at uh, Hadron Colliders at this moment, in particular at LHC, uh, that are trying to um, look for uh, the, the traces of these extra, dimension, uh, extra dimensional theories. Thank you. Can I just add um, something and th kind of throw it back at you? So if there are extra dimensions, then a question to you and you, because we haven't answered this yet, unfortunately, is why, are, why do we only observe three? So there are cosmologists and string theorists who believe that there are more than three dimensions, but they're working on the question of how did the universe evolve so that the, ma the main 
large number of dimensions or just that three we observe. So the question of how the universe evolved to start from, say, 11 or 10 dimensions, which is what string theory predicts, to what we observe today is one we have not yet solved, but you have to solve. Uh, hello. Oh, hi. Um, Dr. Karina, uh, you mentioned that the Higgs boson was a fluctuation in the Higgs field as well as a particle. Can you explain the relationship between those two concepts a little bit more clearly? Yeah. Um, so I, I tried to explain that there was um, something that we call, we, we do some distinction be between what we call the Higgs field and the Higgs particle. Okay. So the Higgs field is really. Um, what uh, in some way is, is, is what we call the medium that uh, kind of um, is in all the vacuum and is the one that uh, in, in this uh, special way gives um, mass to all the fundamental particles we know or to most of the fundamental particles we know. Um, but within the theory, um, what we say is like the vibrations of this Higgs field effectively can be also interpreted as a particle itself. And so there is uh, a Higgs field that is like what the medium that permeates all the vacuum. And there is, uh, as, a, as a remnant of this Higgs field, as a, as a vibration of this Higgs field, uh, there is a, a concrete Higgs particle. And so um, the way we are trying to, um, exp to prove that this explanation of uh, a Higgs medium is the correct one to give uh, ma particles to the to give masses to the particles is by actually measuring this this uh, side effect I would call it and the side effect is the Higgs particle. Thank okay? you. Good, thank you, uh, Peter. Uh, my question is a little bit more specific. Um, I know there's a lot, of, there's a lot of excitement lately about um, the new neutrino mixing angle measurement. Uh, theta one three. So I was wondering if you could elaborate on like maybe the importance or the implications of that. Um, okay. Um, okay. So um, we we didn't know actually if there there are three types of uh, angles. So what we call the solar angle, the atmospheric angle, and this is like the theta one three. That's the other one. Um, so why is that important? Well, um, we, we think that neutrinos are, are really not, um, uh, so we have, neutri we have muon, electron muon and tau are the charged leptons and we, in our standard model, we associate to them the corresponding neutrinos, neutrino electron, neutrino muon, neutrino tau. Um, but uh, given the fact that um, these uh, neutrinos, we have proven some time ago that they, oscill they could oscillate and say therefore a neutrino uh, muon could go into a neutrino electron and so on. Uh, then we just use the jargon to say that um, this neutrino electron muon and tau are not really the mass eigenstates, the real physical states, but that they're combinations of those, okay? So then we, we measure these, these angles and uh, these angles are related to, um, let's say, if we now have neutrino one, neutrino two, neutrino three, uh, how much of neutrino electron mu and tau would be in the neutrino one, neutrino two, and neutrino three. So these are the mixing angles. And so the fact that the, uh, we don't know really, uh, we call, okay, could be that um, we, we know the mass differences, but we know that the, the mass, uh, there could be what we call um, a different mass hierarchy, so that maybe two, the neutrino one is here, and the neutrino two and three are there, okay, at different masses. And they have different compositions on, on this original neutrino electron, neutrino mu, and neutrino tau. So the fact that the theta one three, one of these mixing, mixing angles, um, is sufficiently large, uh, give us uh, different possibilities. And among the different possibilities would mean to understand better uh, what is the mass um, um, hierarchy of these neutrinos, where they are, okay? We have measured mass differences, but we have not measured the actual masses. And so it will tell us if there is one neutrino here and two there, or two here and one here. And this is important because it's relevant, for example, um, in um, other type of experiments that could tell us something about 
um, the nature of the neutrino. And maybe you have not heard too much about it, but the neutrinos could be Dirac or Majorana. That means that they behave a bit different. Um, and um, that one could be its own antiparticle or not. And so um, if given that this uh, angle is sufficiently large, then that opens up a lot of possibilities, for example, for the NOVA experiment here at Fermilab to have a, a shot, so to say, to understand this mass hierarchy. Okay? If this angle would be too small, we wouldn't have that opportunity. So in that sense, it's our very good news um, because uh, this makes the experiments, in a, in a very simple way, this makes the other the experiments we are doing for neutrino physics, like the one here at Fermilab, uh, much more likely to have definite answers about uh, the, the nature of the neutrino and, and the mass hierarchy between these neutrinos. So this is good. And Can I just play my traditional role and mention something in cosmology and then throw it back at you guys? So um, because theta-1-3 is large, it turns out it will be easier for you to measure something, the difference between the way neutrinos behave and antineutrinos behave. The rate for pro that difference depends on the amplitude, and it, it turns out it's, be, it's, it's pretty large, so that's good. So you are going to be able to determine the difference between the way neutrinos and antineutrinos behave, and that could be very important key to one of the questions that's puzzled us for a very long time, which is why there is more matter in the universe than antimatter. So the key to that question, we don't know the answer, again, you kind of have to solve it. So uh, that, the largeness of that angle may help you uh, give us the answer. Um, I was wondering that if the Higgs boson is the particle hypothesized to um, basically give other particles mass, then how is it that the Higgs boson itself can have mass? Because as um, Dr. Karina explained, um, the, if the Higgs boson exists, then it has a mass between like two particular amounts. So how can that be pinpointed if it itself is what gives other things mass? Okay. Well, uh, uh, so the, the short answer, but I will try to clarify it a bit more, is because besides, so the way it gives mass to other particles is by interacting or, I don't know, bumping into them. So being, you know, having some resist, you know, the particles go through this uh, medium and get some resistance, so to say. And this resistance is the strength of the interaction. And so it gives the particles a mass. But the Higgs itself, okay, uh, self, this, the Higgs interact with this Higgs field uh, at the same time. So the Higgs gives mass to itself uh, besides giving mass to the other particles, okay? So that's the idea. The idea is uh, what we call self-interaction, okay? So the Higgs interacts with the other particles and gives them math, uh, mass, and the Higgs interacts with itself and acquires mass. And depending the theories, so if it is just what we call a standard model Higgs, uh, then the mass would be, um, from experimental observation uh, now, um, expected to be in this very short range between 114 and 129 times the mass of the proton. Okay? At least this is what we have heard from the experiments, what we have learned from experiments. However, if the Higgs is not uh, a perfect, if, if, if there is physics beyond the standard model that perturbs the Higgs mechanism in some ways, then the Higgs could behave a bit different. And this is what, uh, when I say by the end of this, this year, we hope to have a cl more clear picture. At least we hope to have a more clear picture if there is a Higgs and if it is a standard model-like. But for example, there could be a Higgs and it could decay to dark matter, and we would not see it in the way we expect to see it. That's one example, okay, that is very plausible. Still, we'll do the same things that it was doing, but uh, we won't see it the, the way we expect to see. So one thing I, I would like to um, emphasize is that um, we have the standard model. Within the standard model, we have the Higgs. If everything is a standard model-like, we will know something rather soon. But nature may decide to be more complicated, still be a Higgs there, but not behave so much as we expected. And this I didn't emphasize it in the, in the lecture because I <laughs> didn't get into the beyond the MSSM part much, but it's another point that is important to, um, to comment on. Jennifer, and then we'll go back over here. You're going to stay online for a few minutes. Go ahead. Okay. 
So, well, I went to the cosmology breakout section, and we talked a lot about the expansion of systems away from each other within the whole universe, looking at galaxies and such. But I was wondering if you've observed or you plan in the future to observe the expansion of systems on a smaller scale away from each other, like within a galaxy or smaller than that. Right. Um, so we can observe stars in galaxies, and we can observe how they move. And as we, point, as we talked about, that does uh, provide evidence for dark matter. But more generally, it seems like the best way to learn about fundamental physics, which is the idea that Leon Letterman pioneered 30 years ago, besides, besides producing particles and accelerators, the best way to do that is to look on the universe on large scales. So it does seem like that's the best way to do it, as he pointed out uh, quite a long time ago. Uh, this is a follow-up question to the um, idea of the expansion. Uh, I, what, what is causing this expansion? Is this some mass, some, or is this some intrinsic property of this universe? Because I hear snippets of cosmological constants and whatnot, and I don't really understand what it means. I was wondering if you can explain right. some of the theories. So, so it, it's going to be difficult for us to resolve this in a few minutes because think about it. Einstein's theory of general relativity predicts that if you have a smooth homogeneous universe, like, that we have it, right, then that leads to the, the universe expanding. That means galaxies moving away from one another. Now, Einstein was a pretty smart guy, right? He never made that prediction. So uh, we're not going to be able to resolve this in a few minutes. But th that's the basic fact, that if you look at the laws of general relativity, they predict that if you have universe, universal distribution of matter, that will lead to the galaxies either expanding away from one another or moving towards one another. The equilibrium position is not sustainable. So they either, we happen to live in a universe that's expanding. It could have been the other way around. So the expansion per se is not predicted, but the movement is either away or before, or for, and it's caused by the gravity. Thank you. Anton? Ah, uh, yes. So, uh, you can take it out. Yeah. So about string theory, you know, I've heard there's actually some concern that many of the variables that you know predict the models of string theory can be adjusted or whatever in very different forms of it. Some have estimated it could be like up to 10 to the power of 500 different varieties. Is there any concern this plethora of potential models might make the whole theory unfalsifiable in any way? I, I'm glad you give me all the easy questions. Um, so, um, well, okay. Um, I was a few years ago before the LHC started running in a panel discussion like this one, and, and someone, uh, a physicist in a public lecture, came and asked, um, so do you think that a string theory can be falsified in the near future? I guess that's your question, correct? Yeah. Um, uh, I would say, in my very humble opinion, the answer is no. Uh, of course, if we would discover, for example, supersymmetry, uh, so supersymmetry usually is at very highly attached to the idea of a string theory, but the string theory lives there in 10 dimensions or so, and so there are many possible vacuum solution and possibilities, and then we come down to Earth, so to say, and uh, we test things at the level of LHC or, or other, but in the particular case, Large Hadron Colliders. Also in relation with cosmology, uh, string theory has something to say. Um, so I think that if we, for example, um, discover supersymmetry at LHC, that will not be a proof of a string theory, but would make the string theories very happy. Uh, if we do not discover supersymmetry at LHC, that will mean nothing because if supersymmetry would be at 10 to the 16 GeV, we won't be able to say anything from LHC or from other uh, considerations. But that means that we are not capable of testing those high energy, uh, high energies. So in some ways, there are things that would uh, put a check mark in the direction of string theory seems to be okay, but there was no really way to. Uh, on my very humble opinion, my colleagues at Chicago may think otherwise, I don't think there is a conclusive way to prove it uh, and certainly uh, to disprove it neither. So it's, it's on very safe grounds. If you do a string theory, you can live there forever. Can I just make a sociological follow-up? I think, I think it's very dangerous to uh, 
to, I think it's been proven historically to be very profitable to let people think about what they want to think about, even if the, the testability of that isn't obvious at the time. So the people who developed quantum mechanics, it wasn't obvious why that was important, but now all of society is based on quantum mechanics. So it's, what you say is true, and you're worried about it, but I still think we should let sm smart people like you work on what they want to work on, because inevitably that historically has led to great things. All right. Uh, I was wondering, uh, I, I understand that the LHC is definitely bigger and better than the Tevatron, but what actually makes the Tevatron obsolete at this point? I, you're going to have to repeat the question. I, I'm slightly deaf. <laughs> I got up. I got up to the LHC. I, yeah, I, I the think um, the the paraphrase. Uh, understand that the uh, hadron collider is bigger, better, faster. But why does that necessarily make the Tevatron obsolete? Was that the gist of the question? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, I think the laboratory uh, Fermi Lab is is choosing to go in a somewhat different direction, uh, particularly uh, to track down the properties of neutrinos. And it turns out that energy is not the critical variable there, but rather intensity, because they, uh, they want to see how one neutrino state changes into another. And what's important is distance. And the parameter that counts actually is the uh, mass squared divided by twice the energy. Uh, and so energy doesn't, in this particular case, doesn't help you. Uh, it doesn't mean that people have forgotten about this. I think the real thing is, is we've probably reached the end of the line uh, with machines like the electron-positron collider, even with Linux, and maybe uh, with proton machines, because you can just imagine how big is something three times bigger. So one will have to look for yet another invention. And people haven't given up on that. And uh, perhaps uh, muon collider will uh, be right. But I don't know. It's going to take smarter people. Uh, younger who are wishing to go on that long journey to find the answer. Thank you. Um, following up the multiple dimensions discussion, should time be viewed as a spatial dimension? And if so, what are the implications of this? Well, this is... <laughs> I'm giving up here. <laughs> so, um, okay. Um, we normally have thought about uh, just uh, extra spatial dimensions and does not include time. And um, this question has been asked to me a few times before and I never gave the right answer, so I don't think I will be able to give it now. Um, so forgive me for that. Um, I don't think it's, uh, you know, there is a, a theory of, 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 of gravity and um, um, that basically can, uh, so when you solve the, the Einstein equations of motion, uh, you can think about adding extra spatial dimensions, and I think that adding extra time dimensions would not be um, giving you compatible solutions of, of the uh, equations of motion, but that's the best I have thought about it, and um, there's no one, as far as I know, that has uh, dared to think deeper in the direction of uh, extra dimensions of time. But maybe we're just too worried about Star Trek and things like that, but no, seriously, I think that, uh, I don't know. Chris, do you think otherwise? <laughs> you want? <laughs> this is a very tough question, but there, there is no self-consistent theory so far that allows for extra dimensions of time. I guess that's the best I can answer. Thank you. I have less a question about physics and more a question about being scientists. Um, in, in light of the recent controversy over whether or not uh, publicly funded su studies would have to be available in libraries, um, do you think that that should or will uh, lead to more involvement you know, in the scientific community with the sort of political issues? Can you repeat the question? Uh, the, the first part, the first few sentences. <laughs> Um, in, in light of the recent controversy over whether or not um, publicly funded studies would have to be available in public libraries. Uh, publicly uh, uh, funded, oh, sorry, that part we didn't get, yeah. Okay, uh, do, do you think 
that would um, that would or should increase the amount of involvement that scientists have in the way the government runs you know, in politics and things like that. Okay, so th that's a that's with all the other questions. That's a hard question. So let, let me break it down. First of all, we are publicly funded. Our research, for the most part, is available to the public, freely available to the public. So physics, about uh, 20 years ago, set up this thing called an archive, which is a bulletin board, on which we post all our papers. That was a great democratizing principle because it allowed people from all over the world to view research even if they didn't have journals. So in physics, we're quite democratic that way. The second part of your question, I think that addre at least addresses some part of your first part of your question. The second part of the question is, that's not true, by the way, in medicine, so it's different fields, is whether we will play a role in policy. Uh, scientists should play more of a role in public policy, and John Peoples is really well equipped to answer that question. Uh, we, we should play a role in providing advice, all right? Uh, and we should take great pains to make sure that our advice is accurate. Uh, I, I don't think that we bring any special skills in terms of governance. Uh, some get along with people better. Uh, they do various things, okay? But uh, our specialty should be to make our, our knowledge that we've acquired uh, useful. I mean, I think you're sort of hinting at things like climate change, which will have a profound effect uh, on the society. But eventually, uh, the people who we elect, I believe in elected government, uh, are going to have to come to terms with the governance part. We should worry about the science part. Are they acting on the right things? Um, this question is also a little bit less about the science. Um, in your biography, it said that you were from Buenos Aires and you went to school in Hamburg. And with that, I'm sure, comes knowledge of more languages than just English. I was wondering, um, between the three of you, how many languages do you speak and has, has this helped you or has the lack of more language hurt you in any way in science? <laughs> okay. Um, I, I, okay, let me just put it in perspective. Uh, I, yeah, I speak a few languages and I have fun doing that um, a lot. Um, all of them as bad as English or worst. Uh, but um, the point is that I think physics, I, I'm being more serious, uh, and has to do with languages, but not only with languages. For me, physics has opened uh, many doors to um, you know, different um, cultures and uh, different appreciations of uh, values in life okay, that are different from my um, original culture. And I think that that is something I am very thankful for and I think has made me a much richer person and, and that goes well beyond uh, science, okay? Not only because we travel a lot and, you know, we go to many different countries in all the continents, um, also my kids enjoy that part um, because I drag them along with me, um, but also just our community uh, and when I say our, it means, you know, from Russia to China to India to Europe to U.S. to Latin America, uh, we are very interconnected. And so you um, have the opportunity as a scientist, at least as a physicist, to be confronted with many different ways of looking at things and, 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 and valuing, va valuing things in life and have given me, I hope, the opportunity of, uh, you know, um, kind of uh, modeling my values and my ideas uh, um, of things in ways that I wouldn't have had the opportunity if I would have had, I would have done maybe something very interesting but much less international. So the international side, uh, which goes along with languages, okay, because obviously if you are in a country, um, you should do the effort to speak the language. Um, to communicate with the people and understand the culture. So they, they both go together. And I think science in general, but physics for sure, for sure is great at that level. Yeah, I agree. It's been a great opportunity for me to meet people from different cultures. The one very small specific comment is, it's remarkable to me, but all scientific discourse takes place in English. Go figure. Yeah, at least in physics. 
I find that uh, to have been a handicap, actually. And uh, I'm sort of at the level of one and a half, where the half is divided up into three or four very badly uh, understood languages. So it's not a very good situation. And I think it's a property of a very, very large country. I, I see the same thing in Russia. The Russians, particularly when you get into the interior, they don't speak too many languages except for the scientists who travel. And uh, it is something I wish I uh, could have done more because I do like to uh, learn about how the other countries work, what are the subtle differences, and uh, why do people behave the way they behave. I would like to know. That you know, I, I, I think I, I, I learned uh, f five languages or so before I was um, before I, I got my PhD. And so one thing I would encourage is that uh, for languages there is some uh, age threshold. So you should really try very hard to uh, um, you know absorb uh, and let your brain expand in different languages as uh, long as you are young because when I think now you know I go to visit my friend in Sweden and you know she's French we speak French all the time between the two of us but now she's in Sweden and when I think oh my god she moved there like a, a year ago and she's my age actually younger than me and uh, I think you know I don't think I will have the strength now to go to a country and try to learn a language and for example you know one thing I really regret I'd never learned Chinese which would be a very good idea now um, so I think that you should use all your opportunities uh, that's my very humble opinion to enlarge your horizons vis-a-vis -vis languages while you are under 25 <laughs> so to say <laughs> Um, since we've already derailed the train away from science for a while, I figure I'll keep us there off the track. So I'm actually an English teacher uh, here at EMSA, and uh, probably lots of suspicion as to what I'm going to ask about, but <laughs> I think it's important that our students be reminded, just as Anna's question of a moment ago reminds them that the world of going forward to be a scientist or an engineer or a mathematician or in the world of technology involves a lot more of your brain than just the part that that works through theorem. Um, and so I want you to be able to, to tell the students here, uh, what's the book on your nightstand tonight? What's... <laughs> to repeat, what's the book that's sitting on your nightstand tonight? What book are you coming home to? What are you to reading? Read? What, what, what are you is reading? the book okay. on your nightstand? I'm reading the biography of Steve Jobs, which everybody should just read. It's unbelievable. It's just amazing. Um, well, <laughs> I, I'm actually uh, um, with my um, older son, <laughs> um, whose Spanish is really good uh, because we um, speak Spanish at home, and I enforce it under death penalty. No, no, seriously. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm reading, I'm, I'm trying to get him into uh, enjoying reading uh, Jorge Luis Borges. Um, so, of course, I read Jorge Luis Borges when I was 17, 16, and, and through the years with my husband, because it's so much fun, and it's, it's a perfect example of literature, languages, and science. Uh, so I'm now, that's what I'm doing now. I'm trying to um, sit with him. It's, it's complicated for him still with his levels of Spanish. He's good, but you know, it's quite, so this is what I'm doing. I'm, I'm rereading uh, the Aleph and fictions of Borges. I think it's called The Voyage of the Beagle. It's one of Darwin's things. And uh, the reason I was interested in it, I, I wanted to understand how a man could accomplish so much simply by observing and drawing inferences from that. Uh, no, no formulas, nothing. That was one reason. The second reason, of course, he uh, went in and out of Chile, Chile, and I expect to spend some time down there. All right, I guess I got to be the one to bring this back. So the studies, the research in cosmology and particle physics, uh, physics is quite different. So 
I was wondering, why is this? Why do we use different explanations when we're talking about really big things and really small things? I, don't, I think I would disagree with you that uh, I don't think we do use different language so that Marcella and I talk in the same language. And again, this was the foresight of people like Leon Letterman 30 years ago who thought that these two uh, intellectual pursuits, people looked in the heavens and tried to understand what was out there. People like Democritus looked inside matter and asked what it was made of. These two people were not speaking the same languages. But people like Leon Letterman broke down that barrier and we're now at a stage where that, I don't think that's true anymore. I think the people who uh, work in my field, work in Marcella's field, and we, we cross fertilite, we do speak pretty much the same language. There's some vestiges of our old astronomy language, which probably Marcella doesn't like, but uh, I, I think I disagree with you. So. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I wanted to add something. I'm also in, in Scott's camp. But the way the sciences are pursued experimentally are very, very different. In some sense, uh, astronomy, as opposed to cosmology, is very much like what Darwin did. You, you can look, but you can't touch. Whereas in particle physics, we want our universe, we go make one. Uh, at least that's the business I was in. You know, make an accelerator to do what they want. And you can't do that in astronomy. It's there. In fact, you, you, you can't see the way it is today. You see it the way it was. So it's, it's, it's very different. And it's taken a much longer time to get cohesion about what is going on. And that's only been, what, 100 years at most? But John, <laughs> isn't it still true that the experimentalists in both groups use a lot of the same tools? Uh, observationally, they don't. And the other culture is different. But the theorists, when there are real theorists, they look at it, the problem in the same way. Because they have a specific uh, idea in mind of how to pursue what, how, it, how it worked. Uh, the, part of the part we work in, which is a more uh, detectors are more involved, but uh, uh, some people like to go out and look at certain things because they can see them and they like them. In the cosmology breakout session, um, we uh, learned about possibly modifying the laws of gravity um, instead of attributing um, anomalies to dark matter and dark energy. Um, I wondered what um, the three, if the three of you had any um, further op opinions to say about that, because it seems like a really um, strange new idea to just well, it doesn't work, so let's change the laws. I don't know. <laughs> that, I mean, I think that's, as I tried to convey, that's the most important question going on now, how we treat, approach these anomalies with, uh, by introducing new stuff or changing the laws. I'm kind of interested to know what Marcella and, uh, and John think, so I'm going to turn it over to them. <laughs> well, um, in theories of extra dimensions, for example, um, that's what you're doing. You're trying to um, modify gravity. But in reality, you are not modify, modifying gravity uh, at the levels that you see it, okay? But you're trying to modify gravity at much larger distances. So basically, um, the idea is that you are assuming that um, uh, in, in, in regions where you have not been able to explore yet, things could behave differently. And it's not that you are tossing away, uh, you know, the things we know and we observe in our everyday experience. It's just that we are trying to, there are two options, okay? Either, either that or there is some um, uh, source of energy or, or dark energy or cosmological constant, correct? And so with the idea of this uh, possibility of extra dimensions of a space, this idea of modifying gravity, uh, came uh, to life and is a, it's a very appealing idea um, although okay, I, I, I work a little bit on this um, maybe six or seven years ago and, um, and then I convinced myself although I, I probably Scott will not um, 
agree on this, and uh, in fact, uh, we have this discussion on uh, uh, giving grants for the Department of Energy you know, to different people working on different areas. And um, in reality, it's very hard, really, to cook up these models of modified gravity, um, at least from um, the, the point of view of uh, making a theory that is self-consistent with all what we know, okay? So, and, you know, we, we usually build theories that maybe could um, explain um, the um, uh, same effects as a, um, as a cosmological constant, but, but the problem is that then we start having a lot of peculiar things that make the theory inconsistent, okay? So, I, you know, and, and people have, of course, come with more and more ideas, and as, uh, as Scott would say, you are uh, the future, so you should keep trying. But, you know, I, I tried for a while and decided that all what I could think of, there was not a good solution for this modified gravity. But, of course, I have been away from the field for the last um, few years. Um, but I think at the moment that's the state of the art, that there is not an absolutely consistent picture of modified gravity. Although it works in some pieces, but it, you can't make the whole picture. Um, there was something called modified Newtonian dynamics. And to me, that's an example of something where a few individuals would focus on a few things it could explain, and they ignored a large amount of things that it couldn't explain, just were left undone. And that's what the, the I'll call it the st present standard model of cosmology, has been extremely successful in just describing an enormous range of phenomena. I think some of the modified gravity things that you're thinking of are, are uh, deeper than that sort of thing. Yeah. Thank you. All right, I just want to hear this from a physicist's perspective. This is more a quantum mechanics question. So if a tree were to fall in a forest but no one was there, did it make a sound? Excuse me, what? If a tree were to fall in a forest and no one was there, it would make a sound. In other words, what defines measurement? <laughs> well, I am not an experimentalist, so I should defer these to, <laughs> to John. Um, um, I, I, you know, I wish I would give you a naive answer, correct? It would make the sound, Noga would be there to hear it, so it would be irrelevant, of my opinion, okay? It would be irrelevant if it made the sound or not. Um, so it's the same as, um, I think, I mean, this is a very naive answer, but, um, you know, if it's, it's supersymmetry is there and 10 to the 16, uh, in my lifetime, at least, I know that that would be irrelevant because I won't be able to prove it. So, but many other people could have it. I guess the one substantial thing I have to say is it's not clear to me that having a human observer is what it takes to collapse the wave function in quantum mechanics. So the fact that there's no human observer does not necessarily mean that the wave function hasn't collapsed. So I think that, I think the tree st could still have fallen and the wave function was collapsed even without humans. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Laura. Hello. So I know that Fermilab is constantly facing budget cuts and that leads to involuntary layoffs and um, some experiments are put on hold or cut completely. So I'm wondering if you think that the U.S. is falling behind in scientific research and education due to the lack of a stable budget. Uh, if I may, may I stay away from budget cuts uh, since I'm so old that uh, they don't bother me. But we are, as a nation, falling away from what I would think the very big and exciting things. Uh, there were two disciplines that uh, I would say the United States transformed. Uh, one was uh, ground-based astronomy, these tremendous telescopes that Hale built, uh, the telescopes like the Hubble. Uh, and uh, particle physics is another example. Uh, at the moment, I think we keep going on things like the James Webb, actually for good reasons, because it is part of the national identity. But I think it's bad that uh, we've lost, uh, or at least in some areas, uh, we've lost the desire to explore. And hopefully uh, that will come back. It's only temporary. I don't know. 
but uh, the SSC was a sign of it. Uh, so, so this is for Dr. Peoples. Uh, I was talking to you earlier about you said you raised like billion dollar grants to build like the accelerators and the equipment at Fermilab. How would you go about like acquiring that type of grant money? <laughs> I have to tell you the truth, I don't know. <laughs> I've, uh, say what it is again. About how would you acquire the grant money to, to build uh, something big? Oh, ah, 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 oh, I thought you, you were referring to some specific program at Fermilab. Well, the first uh, thing is, is the desire. Uh, second thing is uh, a modest feel of fear of failing that never gets out of control so that you go ahead and do it even if it is stupid. Uh, and then you have to know a lot of people and then you have to convince them that, uh, or her, that this is a, that you have a marvelous idea and you, you try this door and that door and uh, those two don't work, look for another door. Um, I, I don't know. It's, uh, Yeah. It, it takes a certain amount of uh, stick to it It's uh, uh, You can always find another way of doing things. That's why I've always been amazed at some of these uh, uh, accelerator builders. They've always, always found a way. Uh, uh, Lawrence actually raised most of his money privately before the war. Uh, how he did it, I don't know. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I hope this doesn't seem like it's coming out of nowhere, but, um, and it's not quite related to physics, but more science in general. Um, I was listening to NPR this morning, and they were talking about um, a study that had, was, um, uh, yeah, the, bird, the, uh, the Asian bird flu, trying to make it more contagious. And I wanted to um, ask your opinions on, um, because I know that you all, like, um, seek to uh, keep learning and um, uh, always want like more knowledge on the subjects that you have. I just wanted to uh, ask you what barriers would um, stop you from learning more or making things like more dangerous. Like what, what, um, wow, this is not coming out coherently. Um, what is the difference between looking for more knowledge and what happened with the uh, Asian bird flu case? What happened with the Asian bird? The difference between looking for more knowledge and... And looking for, like, something to become more dangerous. Like, what stopped the uh, Asian bird flu uh, study from being published, but not, you know, more uh, string theory and stuff like that? So that's an, you're saying that's an example where people pursuing knowledge may have led us to a dangerous place? Yeah. Yeah, I don't think we, um, we, we uh, confront that in any, realistic w in any realistic way, certainly not Marcel and I who never built anything. But, uh, so I stand by what I said initially, that uh, the, there may be some dangers in some specific cases, but I think those are the exceptions. I think, I think we should not apologize for trying to just go where our nose leads up and following our curiosity, and we should pursue that with all our, with all our might. We sh there may be some dangers, but I think uh, those are few and far between, and the benefits far outweigh the costs. Thank you. Two more questions, go ahead. I, th I think the, well, I'll just say a little bit. I think what she said, it's a very deep human feeling. Uh, isn't the phrase, the tree of knowledge bears bitter fruit, and the story of Adam and Eve? So it's, this has been with us for a long time. It's, it's two-edged. Uh, I think it's one of our responsibilities to cope with it. Hopefully you'll do it. Uh, my question is about the graviton. Um, why do we know less about it than the other bosons if we know less? And um, why is it harder to detect or to like notice than the other ones to observe? Okay, um, well, actually we, we don't have, um, well, 
um, the theory of general relativity of Einstein is uh, a theory of gravity, okay? But um, we don't have a, a, what we call a well-defined um, field theory interpretation of gravity, okay? Um, if we could do that, uh, we, we think that the graviton is um, the, the force carrier of gravity, correct? Um, but on the other hand, um, we think, okay, gravity is, um, um, is, what is the force that we observe on every day, but is the one that uh, we have a harder time finding a way of modeling it. Correct? And so we think that there's a graviton, we think that there are uh, copies of the graviton if there are any extra dimensions, because if there are extra dimensions, for sure, gravity will propagate. But we don't really, um, although it's so obvious to us, uh, mathematically, uh, we have uh, a less self-consistent structure as the way we have for the other uh, forces in nature. I guess that's a possible answer. Great, thank you. You get to be last. <laughs> All right, well, um, <laughs> well, my question is more related to dark energy, and I understand that the coincidence problem, as they call it, is kind of a problem, I guess, but um, with, uh, what is it called, with dark energy, causing the acceleration of the universe. Why exactly is that a problem? What exactly makes the coincidence problem a problem itself? There, so there, the problem I tried to talk about today was we're, we're, we're inventing this, it does, it's not observed. The problem you're referring to is once we invent it, then you run into this problem that when you start the universe, you're God and you're starting the universe, you have to fine tune this vacuum energy, this so-called cosmological constant, very, very, very precisely. That is, if you, start, you started the universe at time t equal to zero, there's all this energy floating around. At, at one part in 10 to the 120th, you have to put, set the energy of the vacuum to be extremely small compared to all the rest of it. Why, why did you do that? I want to know why you did that. Because you had to set it precisely at that level for it to begin to play a role precisely today. So that's the thing that really bugs us. Well, good. Well, this was uh, certainly enlightening and, and inspiring, and I'm not sure I understood all the, the questions. Uh, Peter, I'm still pondering uh, that one, as you always do. But um, the, uh, and I know we all have different takeaways from these, but I, I especially appreciated uh, hearing about that the challenges are yours and kind of taking that as a big theme that the challenges are yours. And um, I was reminded of this today. And, and people talk about national goals are to move up the rank in national test score rankings. And I'm going, that's thinking about that big. We, and, and to tie it to this desire to explore, we need goals and challenges that are, are big, that take persistence in a long time and involve passions. And, and so I, I hope that one of the themes you saw today is, is these tremendous great minds uh, have pursued these enormous challenges that are, are quite literally bigger than, uh, than life itself in some ways. And uh, I encourage you to do that. And when you're sitting in classes, sometimes it's hard to think past the next test, hard to think past the next paper. But the idea is that learning how to learn, learning how to love to learn, learning how to think and ask profound questions and to face these challenges are, are what brings us, I think, ties us all here uh, together today. Uh, another quick reflection, the comment about just raising the money. And if you haven't heard Leon's story about the founding of IMSA, that maybe was not quite the scale of the Tevatron funding, but in some ways it was. And, and Leanne, to go back to those early days when you sit down with Governor Thompson, you have this incredible vision about what happens when you bring people across the state 
uh, or you were, and one or two of you may have been a, in a school here, a school there, but bring them together. What great things can happen when you bring them together. And how, how that vision over the last 25 years has translated into more than half a billion dollars in state funding uh, for this institution. So, so it, it, it can be done. And um, if you haven't heard Leon's story about that, we'll give you another chance to do that at some point this year because it, it, it's a powerful story. Uh, and I guess last, I appreciate uh, how you've challenged the students not just to uh, pursue and discover and explore, but to, to communicate this to policymakers. Um, because um, a, a lot of us have, have spent our lives with policymakers. And you've heard of the, the golden rule. Uh, there is a, a second golden rule, and that is he who, or she who has the gold makes the rules. And uh, so our, our funding comes from policymakers at the state level. A Fermi Lab comes from funders at the federal level, the National Science Foundation, international collaboration. Uh, we need to communicate clearly about what we're about, what we're doing, and make science understandable. And uh, Tracy, the book I just finished reading is called That Used to, to Be Us. But, but a book I... Uh, and it's about how America kind of needs to restore this big vision. Um, but, I, but I finished a, a book recently called Denialism. It's about how policymakers and the larger public deny science. It's right on my shelf, if you want to borrow, called Denialism. So, so how can we at IMSA uh, not just take care of the discoveries and the science will advance the human condition, but how are we going to communicate that so the policymakers, people that control funding, put it to, to the uses that enable us to, to see our vision to make people's lives better, to, to translate it into action. So um, a lot to think about today, a lot of takeaways. Thank you for spending the day with us and uh, sharing your great minds with ours.